right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. As you come in, come say hi. Let me know that you're here. Hello, 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 P Fury One. Hello, hello. All right. Always good to know that I'm not just talking to a void because that's uh, that's never fun. Seems like the sound quality should be pretty good. Um, I think I improved the lighting situation just a little bit today, so hopefully that's even a little better. All right. <clears throat> so um, we're going to talk today really about flocculation. Um, a couple quick announcements, logistics sort of things first. Um, I did not have the correct PowerPoint slides posted for today's lecture. I just fixed that one minute ago. So if you are wanting the slides, wanting to um, keep track of the slides, keep up with the slides uh, live with me, definitely go and, and re-download that. Essentially, I just had what the current slides up there um, from last time were posted. Hello, Jay Dutro. 21. Um, so essentially, go get that if you want it. Um, we're going to finish up that slide set and that will transition into the next one, um, next set of slides that are now posted up there. Um, one other thing, a quick correction on the homework. One of the problems had a, a value of 1,000, I think it was 650 um, grams per milliliter. It should have been like the other one, the other parameters that you saw in the, in the problems, 1.65 grams per milliliter. Um, yeah, problem two, and thank you for um, the person who pointed that out. I did correct it and upload the new, um, uh, the correct version of the homework. <clears throat> so if you have any questions, go download the correct, corrected version and double check. Um, that was on a problem too. Okay, so with that, um, this is gonna be our last uh, set of slides, last, last lecture material before our first exam. Um, you've got the homework, that will be due at the beginning of class next time so that we can go through homeworks one and two together. Um, by that time, I will make sure I have at least looked at your homework one um, assignments and Hopefully I can uh, go through, you know, well, I will go through the, the solutions with you and then you can check uh, your work versus uh, my solutions as a way to study. And you can, um, you can take a look at the solutions for homework two. You will have submitted it, but then I'll go through it with you uh, live right there. Um, so hopefully that'll be a good opportunity for you um, so that you are able to um, check you know, this time you have a, an electronic copy of your work and probably a paper copy. And this way, um, hopefully that'll be uh, particularly helpful for you. All right, so with that, we'll get back to flocculation. So we talked last time about how uh, flocks are essentially forming um, maybe on the basis of some destabilization. We destabilize the particles compress that double layer and let the particles start sticking together because they're able to get close enough for the, the sticky forces to dominate. So we don't want the charge forces to separate them. We want the sticky forces to um, bring them together. All right, so then we were starting to consider how are we going to know the math, the kinetics behind how quickly particles stick together um, and really, what can we what can we do about it, or how can we um, predict how many will stick together, so that we can then know how effective has our coagulation been in improving the ability for us to sediment the particles. So maybe the solution here was perfectly happy and suspended. The particles were not settling; they were too small, they were not dense enough, and so they would not settle. Then we add the coagulant and stir it, 
and then they all settle, right? And you can see there's probably still some particles in here. It still has a little bit of a green color, it seems. Um, but most of the particles have now settled out. And so the question here is how, what kind of math can we use to describe that system and predict that system? So that's where we started talking about the mixing conditions where we were referring to mixing as, you know, mixing intensity as how much we're stirring um, a system. And so our mixing intensity equation relates to the power that we're putting in, um, the viscosity of the fluid, and the volume that we're stirring in. And this is a, a per time unit. So it's, you can kind of think of it in some sense, how many mixes per time are happening. So we have that equation. We have the dynamic viscosity, we have the volume, all of that. And you know, conceptually, this is a description of the way that velocity is changing as, a, as it goes away from a surface, the velocity of water moving past the surface. OK, so let's get into k then. And before we um, write up the equation for k, let's think about what exactly we want to answer with our mass balance questions. So when we do a mass balance, the on, on sedimentation, our ultimate goal is to increase the particle size, right? So this increased particle size is the goal of coagulation and flocculation. So we add a coagulant and it causes particles to flock together. And in, uh, in today's episode of Terrible Puns, you can think of flocks not as a flock of birds, but as a flock of turds. Okay, pretend I didn't say that. All right, so when we're increasing the size, the reason we want to do that comes back to the settling velocity equation, where we have g times the rho of the particle minus the rho of the water times that diameter of the particle squared divided by 18 mu. So we can't change much except the diameter. So if we change the diameter, then we can increase the speed at which particles are falling. So what we want at the end of the day is a way to find out the new diameter of particles. So we essentially need the mass balance to help us find, and we're going to solve a problem on this, to help find new diameter of the, of the aggregated particles. Okay, so when we think about some number of particles in volume. What we want to do is take a look and say, we have maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight particles in some volume, some arbitrary volume here. We're going to call this the number concentration initial. So this is eight particles that I just drew. Per one volume. And by one volume, I mean whatever little, whatever volume is in this little pretend circle that I, we have here. Then when we do the flocculation, the coagulation, let's say that on average, these particles, these eight particles stick together and make one larger particle. And so now we've gone, in terms of the number of particles, if all of them stuck together, then we now have the n final equals one particle per volume. So in this way, we, we could describe any number of particles per volume, any concentration. But then we can relate them and say, clearly, the, the volume of the, the number concentration initially divided by the number concentration finally gives us the ratio of 
initial particles per final particle. Now, this would also work if we, let me uh, change colors here for a second. If we added more particles, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and we just had a second particle here of, out of eight, and over and not is still eight, right? Because it doesn't matter how many particles, it's just this ratio here. So the, don't mind the color, I just wanted to show that I'm adding a separate bunch um, just to sh show you that the, the volume basis doesn't really matter here because when we take n naught divided by n, this is eight particles per one volume divided by one particle per one volume. The volumes cancel and the, the particle units cancel. This just gives us eight. So it doesn't matter if it was 16 over two or you know whatever it is. It, that doesn't matter because the volume terms drop out um, of the calculation. Okay, does that make sense? Um, that we can relate how many particles are in the final, final uh, volume there? I can't see your faces, so you gotta tell me if that makes sense. Or if you're a little bit confused, a lot confused, watching something else right now, don't have time for me, you know, gotta, gotta let me know here. Anybody? Just gonna leave me hanging? All right then, well, I, I will continue, but I do wanna hear from you whether or not this makes sense. Okay, so, okay, thank you, awesome. And I guess part of this might just be there's a little bit of a delay. Um, I think I have it set on just a couple seconds, but maybe it's a little longer. Okay, so then in order to consider the mass balance, um, what we wanna do is take a look at how to construct a mass balance to give us something in this form. And we've done something very similar before in, the, in different reactors where we, we've done N over N naught. So it should be very familiar, we just have to invert it, okay? Um, so as we'll see in just a moment, when we construct a mass balance, this is going to give us something that looks familiar and the tools that you've learned at the beginning of class are now applying here. So if we have a chamber, and actually let me see what's what's the next slide. Okay, let me um let me stop here on this slide set. I'm gonna go over to the, the other set of slides. Uh, again, the new set of slides are posted to Moodle now. Um, so I will pick these up now. Okay, so we, we've done this part, talked about this, talked about this, and that. So here's where we essentially just left off. So before we move on to there, so the example is we have particles, uh, wrong way. We have lots of particles initially. Do five here, one, two, three, four, five. And we've got, and not, and, and, and so in order to compare them, let's say we have a, a flocculation chamber that's a CSTR, which is typical. We have a gentle stirring, water flowing in and water flowing out. We'll have N not particles coming in and N leaving. And we have some reaction happening inside there. Okay, CSTR, we've done this before. Um, recognize that this is a first order decay. It's first order because it has to depend on the number of particles in our system. And it's decay because we're decreasing the number of particles. We could look at the mass of particles and do, okay, how is the mass of, of particles changing? But that gets a little complicated because the number of particles is changing at the same time. Um, and so, 
it, it's simpler just to look at the number of particles, and by that, we can tell how big are the, the final particles. So, given that, given that we're doing this decay reaction, we can set up our mass balance at steady state. So that we have zero equals Q times N naught minus Q times N plus the reaction term, which is a negative VKN. So we've done this, we've seen this. This time, instead of solving for, for N over N naught, we're going to solve for N naught over N. Okay. And this is going to be typical for our flocculation, but not always. You know, if we were to do flocculation in a, a small glass of water, which is sometimes what you might do in a rural or developing country situation where you don't have access to um, clean water, you can add maybe a, a chlor pack that does chlorination and adds a coagulant. Um, so it's a, a technology that's out there. And it's like, it will clean a small batch of water for you. It's not a flow through system. You just have it in your gallon jug or whatever. So we might look at flocculation problems that are in batch reactors, um, but a lot of times it'll be in, in the you know, big treatment scale. Most of the time it's gonna be flocculation. So be prepared to do it either way, just as with any of our reactions, any of our reactors, um, you should be able to do both, okay? Right now we're gonna take a look at the case where we've got um, more typical of a water treatment train in a municipal system. And we're going to solve this instead of n over n naught, we're going to do n naught over n. So let's go ahead and divide everything by q. That will simplify things a little bit. v over q is theta. Okay, now I want to go ahead and get the terms like terms together. So we'll say n plus theta kn equals n naught. Okay, so I just added the both terms of n um, to both sides. From here, if we just simply divide everything by n, we get really simply, and I'll uh, flip the sides here, n naught over n equals one plus theta k. So as you probably could have expected, because we are very familiar with first order decay CSDRs, usually we solve it in terms of n or in terms of n over n naught, and that looks like n over one plus theta k or one over one plus theta k. We've inverted it essentially. So this is hopefully connects those dots and looks very familiar. And honestly, you could start, you know, if you happen to remember this as, you know, as a memorization thing where n over n naught for a first order decay CSDR, that's very important. This is the only case when that's true. You could have just started from here and inverted it and have your answer, right? But I think it's more beneficial for you to be able to derive it from here in case I give you a batch or a plug flow or something like that. Um, but at least it should be striking the memory bells here. So that's, that's the way we can uh, derive our mass balance. And from there, we should be able to relate the size of the new particle compared to the initial, if we make some assumptions that we're not changing the, the particles in any way, they're just sticking together, right? Um, so five particles over here, the volume, the volume of five over here should be equal to the volume of one over here if it's if the n naught over n is five. So then we can just do a little simple math, pretend that this one is a sphere, and then use the volume of a sphere, of a new sphere. Okay, so what about k then? We need to solve for that k. I've got a cool uh, chemistry mug. Maybe it'll be clearer over here. Aha. Okay. So k, k is going to be equal to um, a function of several things. First of all, we need a collision efficiency. This is 
the, the probability that two particles that collide stick together when they collide. So it's the efficiency that the collisions are happening on. So when we're talking about collision efficiency, you could say if 50% of collisions result in a new combined particle, that means the collision efficiency is 0.5, right? It's the ratio. Um, so if this guy equals 0.5, then 50% or half of collisions make a new, I'm just going to say a new aggregate. So Okay, and then this is going to happen multiple times, and eventually we're going to have particles, if we let it go long enough, you'll have very large particles that contain lots and lots of the initial particles. Okay, so then in terms of, so that's, that's the first term, and this collision efficiency is going to always be between 0 and 1. You can't have negative collisions. Right? You can't have two particles meet and suddenly there's three instead of two. Um, you know, technically, maybe you could account for a really turbulent mixing that was accidental or something and breaking apart particles, then this would be negative, but we're not going to deal with that. We're going to keep it simpler and just deal with cases that our flocculation is happening in a gently stirred scenario. So collisions can, you know, can make new act aggregates. Now, if the collision efficiency was equal to zero, that's reasonable, but that just means there's no aggregation. The particles are completely stable. If you remember last time we were talking about how destabilizing particles causes them to um, stick together or be able to stick together, so something that's completely destabilized, and you'll see this in some of our problems, if you see that language, you know that that means every time particles meet each other, they're going to form a new particle. If they're completely stable, that means even if they do meet each other, they're never going to stick together because they're happier just off on their own. They are independent particles that way. So the fraction of collisions here, um, it's going to have to be between 0 and 1. You can't have more than 100% of collisions, right? You can't have two particles happen to meet, and that accounts for five collision particles successful. No, it just doesn't work that way. So this must be between 0 and 1. So if you ever solve a problem for this term, then make sure you double check that it's between 0 and 1. The next term is what we call flock volume. And this is something that becomes unitless, and I'll explain that in just a moment. But essentially, this is giving us, so if we look at the rate constant, we need a term to describe how stable and how likely the particles are to stick to each other. Then we also need a term that describes how many particles there are in the system. Add to that the fact that we need a term that describes how quickly the thing is mixed, and that gives us essentially our k, right? This is our, our chance at, that collisions are successful. This is the volume in the water that is occupied by particles, so this gives us some representation of um, how many particles there are on a volume basis, and g tells us how quickly we're stirring the solution. And overall, the k comes out to be per second. So if we take a, a unit analysis look here, the collision efficiency is just a fraction. So that has no units. Okay, no units there. Four is just a number, no units. Pi is also just a number, no units. The omega here, flock volume, I mentioned is going to be unitless 
but we can also see that it has to be because we know g is in per seconds. So the only thing providing units here is the g, the mixing intensity. Uh, so that's that's going to be important, and that also means that it's in per second um, per second units here altogether. This is also an indication, or we also know this because it has to be first order. We need per time units as for the rate constant. Okay, so coming back to the flock volume here. The flock volume is essentially, you know, we have this equation that's pi times the diameter of the particle cubed, and that's the initial particle, times the number concentration of initial particles, all divided by six. Now, essentially what this is saying is this is the volume of particles, of all particles together. Um, or, okay, let me rephrase that. This is the volume of one particle times the number of particles divided by the volume, some arbitrary volume. So the volume that was built into n, or n naught in this case. So here we have the volume of a particle. Um, this is, if we assume it's spherical, right? We assume, and I think we already talked about this assumption, but I'll just remind us here. Spherical particles. We're also gonna assume that they are discrete until they combine. So we have spherical, par spherical particles here then the volume of a sphere, a sphere is simply um, pi times diameter cubed divided by six. This will let me write. <laughs> okay, so that's the volume of a, a one particle. And typically we're going to be dealing with particles that are very small, like 0 0.01 millimeters or something. So that's going to be a very small number if we convert it to meters. It's probably a good idea to convert it to meters because we're going to have to have a cubic length unit here. And yeah, you could convert that to, to liters, or it, it might end up making sense just to make sure you're in meters here, and then you convert the volume here into meters as well. So, so the VP here is that term. And then we have n naught as this term. Okay, so that gives us the volume of one particle times the number of particles divided by the total volume we're looking at. So if I were to say I've got two million particles floating around in my aquarium, that's two million divided by twenty-eight gallons. That's my n naught. And then I tell you the, the volume that one particle occupies, you could calculate the flock volume or the particle volume of that aquarium, and you'd have to convert so that you have the, you know, you could, if you wanted to, convert the flock volume into gallon units, and then you would have gallons per gallons. In this case, <coughs> I'm going to recommend that you always work with cubic meters. So what you'll end up with is volume of the particle is cubic meters times some number that's unitless divided by cubic meters. Um, so ultimately, you're you're getting um, you're getting a unitless number that is like cubic meters of particle. per cubic meter of water. And as you might expect here, this number should be very low, right? There's a very small amount of particles in my aquarium. Um, we, we can see that it's relatively clear. So in terms of the, uh, the particle loading, um, in most cases, this is gonna be a very small number uh, and just as a reference, this is usually less than 10 to the minus 4, uh, just in my experience from 
uh, equations we solve in class. To get anywhere close to a one-to-one -one ratio, a one-to-one -one ratio here would mean all of the volume is occupied by particles. So even at 0.5, if, if the flock volume was 0.5, half of the volume of that you're looking at is occupied by particles. That would be a really, really thick slurry, and you would almost call that, it would almost be less liquidy than mud, right? Would, you'd, get, you'd be getting to a point where it's, it's more like dough or something, I guess. So certainly this is going to be a small number. Um, often I've seen 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, or 7. Just depends on how big the particles are and how many you have in there. Okay, so just kind of have it all out here again cleanly um, with, you know, with everything written out um, specifically. Okay, so let's do a problem. And again, as always, this is a good time if you want to pause um, and work it out on your own or just come back to it later and do that. Um, I'll read the problem, I'll kind of introduce it, and then we'll solve it together in the next page. Um, and it's a good time uh, for you to take, to, to practice this on your own if you like, or um, follow with me. So example 6.2, we've actually already solved 6.1 uh, previously. So to improve their settling, the 0 0.01 millimeter silt particles in that previous example are completely destabilized. And in that problem, if you remember, we weren't able to remove all of them with sedimentation. Okay, so we tried, we checked it out, and not all of them were removed was the answer. So here we say, we're going to completely destabilize them. So make note of that language here. If I can find my cursor. So we have complete destabilization by adding alum. Um, and this is passed after the destabilization in that coagulation dosing. Then it's passed through one of two side-by-side, well-mixed flocculation chambers. The chambers are cubic, each with the dimension being three and a half meters. They are mixed with paddle mixers that input two and a half kilowatts of power into the water in each chamber. The water entering the flocculation chamber contains 10 to the fifth particles per milliliter. And then the question is, what is the average diameter of the aggregates leaving the flocculation chambers. Okay, so take a moment, think about that. I'm going to solve it with you. What I'll probably do, and I just have it repeated here, a little more space to work with. Um, what I'm probably going to do here is um, work quietly for a couple minutes, just writing out um, different components and drawing the diagram. Um, so if you want to pause, go for it. If you want to just work on it on your own um, and just look up as you need guidance, that, that might work too. Um, I always recommend that you, you approach it by first drawing the system. Um, that way you, you make sure that you know what you're looking at. So draw the system, then write out the known components and look at what pieces of information you still need before you can solve a mass balance to get to a point where you can analyze the average diameter of the aggregates. Okay, and I'm also going to bring up Excel to do some of these calculations uh, with you live. Okay, so let's go ahead. Um, again, I'm just going to draw up some stuff, so solve at your own pace or watch, and I'll talk through it in a couple minutes.
Okay, so I've drawn out a few things. I've put some calculations up. I was actually just doing this problem earlier, so I remembered the volume term on my off the top of my head. And we'll double check that, um, and I'll show you kind of how I'm putting this into Excel here. But essentially, right now, what you want to want to know is that we've got the flow rate, that Q, the 3 million gallons per day, is flowing into two side-by-side -side reactors. So essentially they're saying they're doing this in parallel, um, not in series. So the flow then is split into two parts, and we know the volume of each of those chambers is the same, and it's three and a half meters on each dimension of the reactor, and they're cubic. So we can just cube 3.5, meters and that'll give us um, some volume uh, okay so then whatever happens in one is the same thing that's happening in the other so we can just treat this as if the flow is half and send it through one volume all right with that i've got a few other things written we had the collision efficiency equal to one <clears throat> the power was 2500 watts if you remember our g we need to, to solve it in watts, not kilowatts. Um, so we've got that. We have an n naught was given as 10 to the fifth particles per milliliter. I went ahead and multiplied that by 10 to the sixth, which is 1 million, to, um, to achieve 10 to the 11th particles per cubic meter. Um, because it's going to be kind of better to put everything in, uh, in meter units. So then we have the diameter of the particle that was given as 0 0.010 millimeters. That's if we were to take the uh, 0, 0, um, 0 0.01 and divide this by um, 1,000 to go from millimeters to micrometers, because micro is 10 to the 6, 10 to the minus 6, it would be 1 one two three and so then we would have um or excuse me that would that would get us to meters but and anyway either way you do it um you're going to get 10 times 10 to the six so be careful when you when you solve these problems if you're looking at 10 micrometers that's 10 times 10 to the minus six one micrometer is just 10 to the minus six meters so be careful when you're converting that you don't confuse having a 10 in front of the 10 times 10 or a 1 here, a 1 or a 10. Obviously, that makes a difference when you are thinking about it, looking at it. But when solving a problem, sometimes you might take a shortcut and say, you know, instead of writing it this way, you just write 10 to the minus fifth. It's the same thing, um, but just make sure that you're cognizant of which one you mean in case you you say 10 to the minus 6 when you're trying to do that shortcut but you forgot to leave the 10 out there so just be attentive when you're solving that there's a i might be quick about it and i don't mean to um confuse you there okay so with that i'm going to put in a few of these calculations into excel um, Again, feel free to continue solving on your own while I do this. There's plenty more to do in terms of getting to the, the end result.
and just a note here that when I did um, the conversion of the and not to um, to cubic meters, I multiplied by a thousand to go from milliliters to liters, and then by one thousand more to go excuse me from liters to cubic meters. And that's where I did that part. So now we'll set up. our G value. So let me just go ahead and write a couple of these things down for you. <clears throat> Not that one. All right, so we saw the G as 225.7 per second. The omega turned out to be 5.24 times 10 to the minus fifth. Again, that's unitless. Um, K, now we have everything we need to solve for K. Yes, um, I will come back to that in just a second. Um, so we have everything we need to solve for K, so we'll do that in a moment. But at this point, we have basically everything laid out. Okay, so the way I solved for Q, and this was really um, one of the, I guess, uh, tricks of the word problem given here. Um, we were given that in the, uh, and in fact, I think this might have been provided in the previous problem, and so I should have done a better job reminding you of this. But in the previous problem, we had three MGD total. So that was given to us before, and um, yeah, it was not given to us in this problem aside from me writing it up here. So I apologize about that. Um, the previous problem also gave us the conversion from one MVD is equal to this number of cubic meters per second. So given that the total flow is three MVD, this problem does tell us that it, the total flow is split into two places, right? Um, completely destabilized and is passed through one of two side-by-side well-mixed flocculation chambers. Okay, so the water just to split into two ways, going through two of these that are identical. Um, they are, said so they're cubic in dimension, um, 3.5 cubic, um, and they're mixed. Uh, so essentially they're all completely the same, but the water is just split into the two. Um, so with that, I, we can say that Q1 is equal to Q2, and each of those is going to be one and a half MGD because the total is three. And then to convert, we just simply multiply the 1.5 MGD times 0 0.0438, because what you could say is this is that many cubic meters per second per one MGD, right? That's, if you just simply divide both sides up here by one MGD, you're left with one equals that number per MGD. So let me know if that makes sense and clears it up. I hope it does. Um, but if you have more questions, I'm happy to come back to that. So I'm, for now, I'm going to go ahead and start working on um, K. So we have everything essentially we need to solve it at this point. So K then is going to be equal to um, our equation here, one, 
times 4 times that omega value times our g value divided by pi. So our k, this is in seconds, comes out to be 1.50 times 10 to the minus 2 um, per second. So we can just write that as 0 0.0, 0, 0 um, 0.015 per second. Okay, so now we've got our k, and now we should have everything we need to solve the mass balance. So all of this groundwork, just so that we can set up a relationship where we are, um, we are dealing with finding that, that difference between n and n naught. Okay, so remember from this guy, from n naught over n, we can find some ratio of volume. Um, so this is what we want. And so again, we, we did this just a few minutes ago, but 0 equals q n naught. And this would be, we'll, use, we'll just select one of these, because the same thing is going to happen in both. So we'll just take a look at one of them. So q and not, we'll say that's q1 and not, minus q1 n minus v k n. This will simplify as we showed earlier to n not over n1 is equal to uh, 1 plus theta, I'll say theta 1, k. Theta 1 and theta 2 are the same um, because the, the volumes are the same and the flows are the same. Okay, so that's our equation. And given that we have all of these things, then we can figure out um, how, how many initial particles are in each final particle. Uh, I didn't mean to go there. Okay, so when we do that, we'll come back over to Excel here. And we can say n not divided by n equals, and this is going to be, now, there's room for confusion here because some people will try to solve for n by itself. And n by itself, given the fact that you know something about n not, and then plug it back in here, it, that, that is the wrong way to solve it because it ends up as circular logic and will give you, um, if you do find an answer from there out of, in the frustrating moment of trying to figure something out, it will be wrong. Um, so whenever you have these problems, you want to look at that ratio. Um, don't feel like you need to solve for the final number concentration. We're not, we're pretty much, I mean, I guess we could solve for it in a sense, but typically what we're doing is just looking at that ratio and you should have enough information to find that ratio. Okay, so with that, we can say this is equal to one plus um, our theta, which is V over Q. We'll do volume here divided by the flow rate here times k that we solved for. So, and I don't really want that in scientific formation, so we'll go spec. We'll just put this as general. So 10.8, essentially. 10.81, 10.82. So with that, what we can say is our n naught over n is 10.82. So on average, after this process is completed, we have almost 11 particles of the initial particles in each of the aggregates. So each of, each of the uh, particles that are leaving this system have about 10.8 of the original ones. With this, and with the assumption that the particles are spherical and then make new spherical particles, we can say that our volume of 
a particle, well, let, let's say this, the volume of an aggregate on average is equal to 10.82 times the volume of a particle. Okay. Essentially, we're just saying the volume is conserved when we make new aggregates. They're just, you take two tennis balls and glue them together, you have the two times the area of one tennis ball, right? It's, a, it's that simple. So when we do this, then we can convert and solve instead of the volume of the aggregate, we can do it in terms of the diameter of the aggregate. So looking again to our equation for the volume of a sphere, we know that D the diameter of an aggregate, which is what we're solving for, cubed times um, times pi divided by 6 is equal to 10.82 times the diameter of a particle cubed, so the initial particle, times pi divided by 6. So in this way, we can solve for that unknown that we're looking for and find, you know, based on the diameter of the particle that we're given. So these will cancel. So we'll have a six. And then we're left with an equation and we can solve for the diameter of the aggregate. If we simply take, we can go back to our Excel sheet and say the aggregate is going to be equal to, um, Let's see, how do you do this? Okay, so instead of doing like a cube root, we're gonna do something to the power of one divided by three. That's, that's the easy way to, um, to do the cubed root in Excel. There might be, there's probably some other way too. Okay, so what we are, what we're gonna do then is take 10.82, in fact, to make this even a little more um, exact, we're going to take, and I'll answer your question in just a moment, we're going to take that here, and so that's the um, 10.82 that we solved for, that's the n naught over n, and multiply that by the diameter of the particle cubed. And that should give us our final answer. That is in meters, or we can convert that and say this guy multiplied by 1,000 is going to have that many millimeters. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and write this in and then answer your question. So D aggregate here, our final answer was 0 0.0221 millimeters. And it would be fine if you left it in meters unless the question asked specifically for something there. Okay, so consider this and let me know if this makes sense. Um, in the meantime, uh, let me answer Dre Dre your question. Um, so where did we get theta? Um, theta is calculated. So theta is our hydraulic residence time. And so theta is going to be the volume uh, yeah, volume divided by flow rate, so V over Q. So theta um, came up when we divided, so in this equation, we can divide everything by Q as we're simplifying. So this goes to one, this goes to one, this becomes V over Q, which is theta. So that's where our theta comes in, and we need the theta. The theta then is with one, one half of the flow going through each part, we have <clears throat> the flow rate here, so Q1 is equal to 0 0.0657 cubic meters per second, and we can take the volume that we calculated, the 42.875 cubic meters, and divide that by this flow rate, um, and we get a theta. And I just built that into the calculations when we were um, performing this part here, I just took V1 divided by V4 here, that's um, V1 is the volume divided by 
before, which is the flow rate. So that's a volume of divided by flow rate. So I just built it in there. We could have we could have solved it separately and said theta equals v equals v divided by q. And so then that would be your theta, that's in seconds. All right, um, any other questions on this? So this is a, a good example of a flocculation problem. And you know, on an exam, I will try to keep it so that we're not, we're not continuing with the same exact um, numbers so that you know, basically if you make a mistake early on, then it doesn't carry forward too far. Um, so, we could make a problem that takes you all the way from the first sedimentation, remove some particles, do the coagulation, flocculation, calculate how big the particles are going to be after that, and then um, and then come back to sedimentation again and, and do that. I'm not going to sequence them all in a row with the same numbers. If I do sequence them or sequence a problem like that, I would give you um, new numbers to use in let's just assume we have this many at, at some time. So, but I want to, I wanted to say that because these systems are very connected. Um, and the, the reason we care about this is because, you know, compared to 0 0.01 millimeters, the 0 0.022, they're going to settle a lot faster. Um, and it might be good practice for you to consider and solve for the sedimentation velocity or the settling velocity for those two different particles. <clears throat> okay, so any other questions, please let me know. Um, I just have some, some old notes here. I wanted to, to show you something. Um, this is kind of the last, last thing I'll, I'll talk about. Um, so if we think about what would happen if instead of putting these side by side? So just a moment ago, we had, and uh, let's get the fish tank. Sure. A moment ago, we had the case where they were side by side. But what if we did um, instead of side by side? What if we did um, so case one is this way. And instead of that, we could do, we have flow going through, and we, we have a box here, and then another box, and then a third box or something. And sometimes I, I do assign a problem like this. I think there's one in the book that's kind of like this. Well, one thing you could see here is, in this case, in the top case, it's kind of like you just have one larger reactor, and that's it. Um, in this case, we have um, something different happening because we're growing particles here and then we're taking, you know, if this is our n naught, then we have an n1 here that's acting as the final from this one and the initial for this one, and then an n2 that's doing the same thing, and finally n3 is our last one. And then q, of course, would be consistent across all of them. So in this case, um, you know, we could compare the difference between a, a parallel versus a series type of reaction. Um, so, you know, looking back on those calculations we just did, I have written up here again, um, you could potentially compare what that would do if you had three different reactors in series. Um, so I think I mentioned this before, but if we do reaction reactors in series, you can use this n naught and n1 and sequence them. And when you multiply them across, because that's essentially what you have to do, you're multiplying that 1 plus k1 theta 1 times 1 plus k2 theta 2. If you go through this, you can end up getting n naught over n3. So you could solve for the, the number of initial particles to the whole system, to the final system, even if you have several reactors in series, you just need to put the mass balances in place. Um, and then um, 
do this accordingly. So we, we've already talked about that. I just want to mention this because um, there is a problem in the book where it talks about um, how many particles are coming into the second one. And there are, there are some interesting things we could do that are relatively simple. And it's based on that concept that um, we can know something about n, we'll say n1 over n0. We can say that equal to um, 1 plus theta, whatever the hydraulic resonance time for that first one is, theta times the reaction in that first one. We also know that that same generic logic, theta 2, k2, um, so really just getting you to think about this in terms of practically speaking what this could look like. And then if we wanted to know some information about number three, the way to get there would be to multiply this term with this term and then also with this term. And then we'll see a bunch of things cancel out and then we have something that relates N3 to N not. And that's that's just what I what I had drawn up here um, previously. Okay, so I think that's I think that's it, all that I wanted to, to talk about. So um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. On Tuesday, we will be we'll be going through um, both homeworks. We'll be solving them in class. That's why I'm asking you to submit the second homework assignment before class um, for that exam review. Uh, in the future, for exam two and for the final exam, I'm basically going to have one homework for each of those exams. Uh, this first one, I, I felt like we need a, a broader foundation chemistry review, introducing all the mass balance stuff, and then going over a couple of the simpler um, components so in the future, it'll just be one homework assignment, and that'll be due essentially the class period before the exam, which in, at which time we'll also do a review. <clears throat> okay, so I'll be here watching for questions for a couple minutes. I'll feed my fish, provide some more entertainment, um, and just let me know if you, if you have questions. Otherwise, we'll see you, um, see you next time. Just scared of the light. So I have, when I turn off the light, it goes a lot more aggressively. Okay, so for reactors in series, uh, is it possible to also, or would it also be possible to solve the first reactor on its own and then use the re results and so on? Um, yeah, so it, sorry, it took a moment and then I looked away to, to feed my fish. So I'm going to come back to your questions now. I can see your questions. Um, I think there's a little bit of a time delay, and if you ever paused, um, paused in your chat or in uh, your video, then it's probably added um, more delay. So, um, for reactors in series, would it also be possible to solve the first reactor on its own? In, in effect, that's exactly what you're doing. Um, so yes, my answer to that is yes. And what I'm going to say is, when you when you do this in series and you're multiplying them across, you could exactly say n1 over n0, let's say that's, let's say you get 10, um, n1 over n0 equals 10, let's say. Um, and then in this next one, you would, you would need to use your answer here. Well, you don't have to use your answer here, but you're going to, um, since you, for the second reactor, you might not know the information you need about N1 yet until you solve that one first. But essentially, yeah, the, the thing is you can um, 
you can you can do that. Yeah, as you said, you can use that result to solve the next one. Um, it becomes simpler to just combine them and multiply them all across. Um, as you see here, it's probably simpler to just go ahead and do it all at once. But yeah, it, either way, it, algebraically, it, it makes the same amount of sense um, in both cases. Okay, so the next one, when studying for the first exam, should we focus on problems from slash similar to homework assignments? I uh, yes, what I'm going to say is I, it, especially with the online mode, I do need to make them a little bit different um, to make sure you're not just copying something else that you've um, seen already or, or whatever. So in that way, I'm, I'm going to make it the same scope uh, in terms of what we're solving here or what we do on the homeworks. You're going to use the same skill sets, right? You're going to be using mass balances to critically look at problems and solve um, for the uh, uh, for the different pieces and um, what you need to do is make sure that you those skills are in place can you derive a mass balance so could you get this portion for a series of batch reactors where you're taking a batch reactor letting it run for some amount of time, dumping it into a new one, run, letting that one run for a certain amount of time, and give me an answer, right? Can you formulate what that looks like? So you need to be able to use these skills and adapt them to different conditions, but the scope is gonna be the same. Um, the skills that you've learned will be uh, exactly what you need for these. Um, now, I can't teach you all of critical thinking. So there's it, going to be times where it probably stretches you a little bit. And it's by design that I'm going to make it a little bit challenging, at minimum, a little bit challenging so that I can see really what you've learned. If I make a mistake and make it too challenging, I'm going to come back and um, make it fair in terms of the way I grade. And that has happened before. Um, I will apologize if that does happen. And I'll, I, my goal is to grade based on what you've learned. Okay, a um, couple more questions here. Do we take the exam in person? No, it'll be online. Um, I'm going to do it a lot like the homework, except you're going to have a very specific window of time. You're going to, um, you're going to have the file posted at, let's say, uh, 11.55 Central Time. You have the full class period, and then I'm going to add a few minutes to the end in case there's any technical difficulties. And so you'll have to submit by 1.30 or 1.35 or something like that. Give you some time to scan your work, to enter them, enter your uh, entries into the system, and give you time to email me or contact me if you're having trouble with something. So I'll give you more instructions about that, but it's going to be kind of like a take-home exam, but with a specific time window. Um, normally, I give you equation sheets and a periodic table and stuff anyway, so that's going to be my plan. And then um, I, I did this last semester, and it, it worked out pretty well uh, for the final exam last semester, um, where I'll, I'll do some work on the front end to make sure that it's not something you can just Google and or tag and find an answer or whatever, um, so that it's fair, um, fair as best as that I can. You're held to the honor code, and it's challenging enough so that I can see your thought process of uh, trying to solve the problems. So that's, um, that's what the exams will be like. Um, the exam, uh, it's a good question. So let me pull up our syllabus here. And I see another question. I'll come back and answer that in a moment. All right, so exam one should be a week from today. So today, I think you can see this, right? So today is the fourth. Um, the exam will be a week from today. And by the way, there's going to be some more instructions in the syllabus on the exams. I'll send more, um, more detailed information um, next week during our exam review. Okay, can I explain why I did the N1 over N0 
in the series example, but and not over n in example 6.2. All right. Um, okay, so So I did, you said, can you explain why you did n1 over n0? Um, okay, so this, um, I, sh I really probably should not have left this, <laughs> this stuff here. Um, the series examples here, notes from last time, I, I, um, you can do either way. You can do n1 over n0, or you could do n0 over n1. And ultimately, when you put, put all these together, you're going to get either n3 over n0, or you'll get n0 over n3. So it doesn't matter too much which form you do. If you carry that same pattern through, it will simplify and you'll you'll resolve it. It's just a matter of, you know, in this case, the initial divided by the final, that's going to be the 1 plus theta k form, whereas the final divided by the initial is 1 over 1 plus theta k, right? So sorry for the confusion here. Um, it's possible to do either one, um, depending on which one you're looking for, or you could just do one and then invert it if you needed the other, right? So that it doesn't matter there. It's just, just the algebra. Um, and so in this uh, series example, I'm sorry, I, I wrote this improperly. This I should have kept that as 1 over because um, that's final over initial. Um, so in my in my rush there, I didn't catch that and clarify that. Um, hopefully that makes sense there. So is the homework a good representation of the material that we'll see on the exam? Yes. Um, now the exam, so the, the homeworks, what we've done is we had some chemistry um, as a review. We have done mass balances and some combination of just word problems that are asking you to do algebra um, and adding a little bit of mass balance type work. So really the, the class generally is about taking mass balances to applied problems in the settings of water treatment, right? So um, the exam problems will be very similar in scope. Maybe I will focus in and have several points on one thing to make sure you I can see how much of that topic you understand. Um, but again, I, I do give partial credit on the exams. And um, the, uh, the homeworks and the problems we solve in class, you, you know, if you were to compare the homework problems and then look at the example problems, there's probably some differences and you might feel like one is harder than the other. That's not my intent either way. The same thing will happen with the exams, right? The, Sometimes I'll make an exam and it'll be a little easier than I meant to or something. Sometimes it'll be a little harder. It's the same skill set as the point and it's going to be, um, it's going to be uh, really testing the, those knowledge sets. Okay, so um, tests on chapters one, two, and six, yes. And we're gonna spend a lot of time in chapter six. So chapter six is probably going to be on most of the, um, most of the exams in some form or another. Chapter six is really the water treatment. One and two is mass balance and chemistry. Um, chapter five will be in for the wastewater because that's like what happens to the, the wastewater downstream in like a river. So we'll, we'll essentially be in chapter six and then chapter five a little bit um, towards the end. Am I gonna give any bonus problems? Um, I might, sometimes I do, um, it's not too common. You know, maybe if I had a, a fun idea for a challenging problem, but I thought it was too challenging, that's a case where I might, but um, no promises there. Uh, good questions. Any, anything else? Anything that I miss? How's the um, the time delay? Is it? Are you feeling like there's too much delay here? I can uh, can try to um, 
make it so that messages show up faster. I'm not sure that I can, but might might be able to try. Okay, good. So I just saw that the delay isn't very long um, as a reference. Okay. So part of the problem was I was feeding my fish, being being irresponsible during class, right? Okay. All right. Well, I don't have anything else for you, and it seems like there's not too many other questions. Thanks, guys, for uh, getting back to me and helping answer that question. So I will end here. And I'll see you guys on Tuesday. So be sure to be thinking of questions in case you have any for for the exam, any problems, particular issues you're having with the homeworks. Um, that'll be a good time to, to ask them. Otherwise, have a good weekend. I'll see you later.